There was a knock at the door. Come in, he said sharply, and climbed down the ladder. He stood on the floor, twiddling his brush. It was his neighbour Parrish. His only real neighbour, all of the folk lived far off. Still, he didn't like the man very much, partly because he was so often in trouble and in need of help, and also because he didn't care about painting, but was very critical about gardening. When Parrish looked at Niggle's garden, which was often, he saw mostly weeds. And when he looked at Niggle's pictures, which was seldom, he saw only green and grey patches and black lines, which seemed to him nonsensical. He didn't mind mentioning the weeds and neighbourly duty, but he refrained from giving any opinion of the pictures. He thought this very kind. He didn't realise that even if it was kind, it was not kind enough. Help with the weeds and perhaps a praise for the pictures would have been better. Well, Parrish, what is it? said Niggle. I oughtn't to interrupt you, I know, said Parrish, uh, without a glance at the picture. You're very busy, I'm sure. Niggle meant to say something like that himself, but he had missed his chance, and he said, Yes. But I've no one else to turn to, said Parrish. Quite so, said Niggle, with a sigh. One of those sighs which are the private comment which are not made quite audible. What can I do for you? My wife has been ill for some days, and I'm getting worried, said Parrish, and the wind has blown half the tiles off my roof, and water is pouring into the bedroom. I think I ought to get to the doctor, and uh, the builders too, only they take so long to come. I was wondering if you had any wood and canvas you could spare, just patch me up and see me through for a day or two. Now he did look at the picture. D dear, dear, said Niggle, uh, you are unlucky. I, I hope it's no more than a cold that your wife has. Um, I'll come round uh, presently and help you move the patient downstairs. Thank you very much, said Parrish, rather coolly. But it's not cold, it's fever. I should I should not have bothered you for a cold. My wife's in bed downstairs already. I can't get up and down with trays with my leg. But I see you're busy. Sorry to have troubled you. I'd rather hoped you might be able to spare some time to go to the doctor and see how I'm placed and uh, the builder too, if you really have no canvas you can spare. Uh, of course, said Niggle. The other words were in his heart, which at the moment was merely soft without feeling it at all kind. I could go. I'll go, uh, if you're really worried. I am worried, very worried. I, I wish I wasn't lame, said Parrish. So Niggle went. You see, it was awkward. Parrish was his neighbour, and everyone else was a long way off. Niggle had a bicycle, and Parrish didn't, and couldn't ride one. Parrish had a lame leg, a genuinely lame leg, which gave him a good deal of pain. He had, he had to be remembered, as well as the sour expression and whining voice. Of course, Niggle had a picture and barely time to finish it, but it seemed that this was a thing that Parrish had to reckon with, and not Niggle. Parrish, however, didn't reckon with pictures, and Niggle could not alter that. Curse it, he said to himself as he got on his bicycle. It was wet and windy and daylight and waning. Daylight was waning. No more work for me today, thought Niggle, and all the time that he was riding, he was either swearing to himself or imagining the strokes of the brush on the mountain or the spray of leaves beside it. He just first imagined in the spring. His fingers twitched on the handlebars. Now he was out of the shed. It was exactly the way in which to treat the shining spray which framed the distant vision of the mountain. But he had a sinking feeling in his heart, a sort of fear that he would never now get a chance to try it out. Niggle found the doctor and left a note at the builder's. The office was shut and the builder had gone home to his fireside. Niggle was soaked to the skin and caught a chill himself. The doctor did not set out promptly as Niggle had done. He arrived the next day, which was quite convenient for him, as by that time there were Two patients to deal with in neighbouring houses. Niggle was in bed with a high temperature and a marvellous pattern of leaves and involved branches forming in his head and on the ceiling. 
didn't comfort him to learn that Mr. Parrish had only had a cold. Mrs. Parrish had only had a cold, and was getting up. He turned his face to the wall and buried himself in leaves. He remained in bed some time. The wind went on blowing. It took away a good many more of Parrish's tiles and some of Niggles as well. His own roof began to leak. The builder didn't come. Niggle didn't care, not for a day or two. When he crawled out to look for some food, Niggle had no wife. Parrish didn't come round. Uh, the rain had got into his leg and made him ache, and his wife was busy mopping up water and wondering if that Mr. Niggle had forgotten to call at the builders. Had she seen any chance of borrowing anything useful, she would have sent Parrish round, leg or no leg. But she didn't, so Niggle was left to himself. At the end of the week or so, Niggle tottered out of his bed again and tried to climb the ladder, but it made his head giddy. He sat and looked at the picture, but there were only no patterns of leaves or visions of mountains in his mind that day. He could have painted a, a far-off view of a sandy desert, but he hadn't the energy. The next day he felt a good deal better. He climbed the ladder and began to paint. He'd just begun to get in into it again when there was a knock on the door. Damn, said Niggle. But he might just as well have said, come in, politely, for the door opened all the same. This time a very tall man came in, a, a total stranger. This is a private studio, said Niggle. I'm busy, go away. I'm an inspector of houses, said the man, holding up his appointment card so that Niggle on his ladder could see it. Oh, he said. Your neighbour's house is not satisfactory at all, said the inspector. I, I know, said Niggle. I took a note to the builders a long time ago, but they never came. Then I, I've been ill. I see, said the inspector. But you're not ill now. No, I'm not a builder. Parish ought to make a complaint to the town council, get help from the emergency ser services. They're busy with worse damage than any up here, said the inspector. There's been a flood in the valley and many families are homeless. You should have helped your neighbour to make the temporary repairs and prevent the damage from getting more costly to mend than necessary. That's the law. Plenty of material here, canvas, wood, waterproof paint. Where? asked Niggle indignantly. There, said the inspector, pointing to his picture. My picture? exclaimed Niggle. I dare say it is, said the inspector, but houses come first, that's the law. Uh, but I, I can't. Eagle said, no more, for at that moment another man came in, very much like the inspector he was, almost his double, tall, dressed all in black. Come along, he said, I'm the driver. Eagle stumbled down from the ladder, his fever seemed to have come on again and his head was swimming. He felt cold all over. Driver? Driver, he chatted. Driver of what? You and your carriage, said the man. The carriage was ordered long ago. It has come at last. I'm waiting. You start today on your journey, you know. There now, said the inspector. You'll have to go. But it's a bad way to start on your journey, leaving your jobs undone. Still, we can at least make some use of this canvas now. Oh dear, said poor Niggle, beginning to weep. It's not even finished. Not finished, said the driver. Well, it's finished with as far as you're concerned. At any rate, come along. Niggle went quite quietly. The driver gave him no time to pack, saying that he ought to have done that before, and they would miss the train. So all Niggle could do was to grab a little bag in the hall. He found that it contained only a paint box and a small book of his sketches. No food, no clothes. They caught the train all right. Niggle was feeling very tired and sleepy. He was hardly aware of what was going on, when they bundled him into the compartment. He didn't care much. He'd forgotten where he was supposed to be going, or what he was supposed to be going for. The train rang almost at once into a dark tunnel. Niggle woke in a very large dim railway station. The porter went along the platform shouting. But he wasn't shouting the name of the place. He was shouting, Niggle! Niggle got out in a hurry and found that he'd left his little bag behind. He turned back, but the train had gone. Ah, oh, there you are, said the porter, this way. 
What? No luggage? You'll have to go to the workhouse. Nigel felt very ill and fainted on the platform. They put him in an ambulance and took him to the workhouse infirmary. <laughs>